this is not, as you know, this is not a normal um, kind of career or a normal kind of undertaking. Basically, ni- 1979, I saw the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I was an English teacher. I was very moved by the um, scene at the end where Francois Truffaut had a contact with the aliens. I was teaching science fiction in school at the time because I was teaching high school. And I came to find out that Dr. J. Allen Hynek was the uh, consultant on that film with uh, Steven Spielberg. And so I did my research and found out he had a center for UFO studies in Evanston, Illinois, that he had been part of Project Blue Book. So just by accident, you know, I live in Colorado. I went to uh, Chicago for a wedding and decided to drop in because I was there anyway into his offices at Kufos. I got to meet him. He asked me to work with him for six years doing Italian translations. So I worked with the best. You know, Kynick was the best. At that time, he had the Center for UFO Studies, and Steven Spielberg was even on his board of directors. So, you know, I I got to see all kinds of cases. I got to travel with Alan. Um, He taught me how to do field research. Uh, I even have my little Kufos card. But the thing that was important is that he basically taught me how to listen. Mm. Very, very fine art, isn't it? Yeah, because if you uh, are listening to a case or witnesses and you let them talk without making any judgments, you get the whole story. Yes, people tend to uh, to break in when somebody's trying to describe uh, an experience, don't they? A lot of people, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Well, what happens is that they use their own frame of reference and they say, oh, that person's lying or that person isn't telling the truth or, you know, they're exaggerating. But he taught me just to keep quiet because I learned after 40 years from now uh, that uh, basically, uh, you know, the truth is stranger than fiction. A lot of this is true. Oh, I, I think so, too. I am a believer. Uh, uh, just so you know, I, I am a newbie to the uh, whole UFO uh, agenda, and uh, I, I got started when I watched uh, the documentary, uh, The Phoenix Lights. So kind of the same thing as you as far as a start. Um, what was it like working with J. Allen Hynek? That, that just must have been fantabulous. Yeah, it was. He was a great guy. He, if you saw Close Encounters, he, he's that very distinguished gentleman with the white hair and the pipe. He always had that pipe. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, he, he basically um, was trying to get to the truth. And you know that he had worked in Blue Book, so, uh, you know, that he had worked for the government, you know, the Air Force. And, and you know that in 1969, the... Um, the uh, content committee report here at the University of Colorado claimed there was nothing to UFOs, and that just put the kibosh on everything. So he was very angry about that. So he had files that he was investigating. He had, you know, talked to he, – he did, like, the Pascagoula, Mississippi case, you know, Hicks and, and, and Parker, and, and, and just cases that came up with abductions. I mean, he was fascinated. I never heard him tell me um, what uh, what he thought they were, but he did say that they were interdimensional as well as interplanetary. Do you think he had any inside information? Um, I know, didn't he get a little um, uh, perturbed uh, with the government? He felt like he was being used or something like that at the end. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Well, do you think he had any inside information? He must have had something, don't you think? No, he had inside information, but they were keeping a lot from him. Uh, and he was angry because he needed to have everything. I mean, when you're studying this, you need to have everything. And I remember that he was very close to Linda Moulton, how it was doing at that time the cattle mutilation 
cases, and, and Alan was fascinated with all of it because, you know, being Italian, uh, cattle mutilations, crop circles, uh, abductions, sightings, it's like a cosmic minestrone. I call it minestrone, the Italian word for soup, that has everything in there. Well, you know, uh, you sure don't have much of an Italian accent anymore. No, well, no, but I speak perfect Italian. <laughs> I uh, I lived there. I lived there for um, fifteen years, and and could do my work there much much better than here. And I came back in two thousand and seven. I was teaching in Rome at the American Overseas School of Rome. That was my day job, and because I had worked with Heineck, they put me on TV. I wrote articles. I still do. I write for a magazine in Rome called X Times. And I just did the Clifford Stone case for them, and I also did the uh, interview with Kenneth Arnold's daughter for them. So, you know, the good part about my work is that it goes viral. It goes to Italy, and I, I spoke in France, so it goes to France. It goes to these places. Well, now, you've been doing this for 40 years, so uh, yeah. after 40 years... What's, what's your thought on UFOs? Uh, what do you think they are? Do you think there's... I have no idea. <laughs> after 40 years... Well, you know, somebody asked me on a show last week uh, about MUFON. They said, you know, MUFON's been uh, in business now or, or together for 50 years, and uh, we're no further along than we were 50 years ago. Um, so it takes a lot for somebody um, to keep digging in and interviewing and investigating uh, for 40 years like you have. Uh, what do you think has, has caused you to, uh, you know, keep that fight going? Well, you know, first of all, uh, i got to say a couple of things. Uh, thank God for MUFON because they do the sighting part, okay? So we got all this archive of sighting. Uh, thank God for other researchers who work with abductions or, or uh, contact. I prefer to call it contact. I was really close to Dr. John Mack. He came to Rome, to Italy, and spent some time with me. Plus, I was, I was his translator in Florence when he gave his last speech, uh, one of his last speeches. So, you know, thank God for those guys out there. Thank God for the crop circle researchers. I don't do that kind of work. You know, thank God for my colleague, Linda Howe, who did the, the cattle mutilations. I mean, all these guys put their heart and soul into it. The problem is, and I'll be honest with you, we don't all get together. If we would all get together, um, we would be able maybe to get to it. But the uh, UFO um, uh, research group is so splintered that we just we don't get together and discuss all this. So what would I like to do? What's my dream? To have, have this be part of a university class, to have a whole entire section of a university and call it exopolitics, which is where I've gone, uh, and, or sociology or exosociology or something in the, socio, in the social sciences department. You know, I've written five books of, of all, they're all interviews, every one of them. I mean, I've got you're breaking up there, Paula. I've got uh, 38 interviews in my last book. Do you hear me now? I hear you now. Yeah. Uh, so if we could have in the university, if we could have, uh, a, 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 you know, some kind of department, we would we'd be get at this. Well, uh, now you are a, a teacher by trade. Is that correct? Yeah, I have a master's of education. In, in education. Uh are there any classes in universities or colleges about UFOs? Have you ever seen one? No, I know there that uh, there are some though in the East Coast. I teach online for Michael Sala's Exopolitics Institute, so I teach three different classes. I teach one on Hollywood and disclosure also. Ah, very good. What you know, I uh, I was speaking or interviewed. Um, Karen Dolan uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we talked a lot about the whole uh, Hollywood slash UFO, how they portray UFOs and aliens. What's your thoughts on that overall? 
Well, I think they're, that Hollywood started out with the day the earth stood still, trying to do some kind of disclosure. I, I think, uh, you know, that was a very powerful movie. I think Close Encounters was some kind of disclosure. I think E.T. was important. However, then we have the gloom and doom. We have Independence Day and, you know, uh, all that other stuff that's entertainment. So I think it's a mixture of both, but I do think that there is a Hollywood connection. So you think that the, the somehow the government or the powers to be uh, are working in conjunction with Hollywood to disseminate this information very cryptically almost and, and somewhat slowly? Yeah, well, that would be normal to see that the reaction of the general public is, in my class, I talk about um, the uh, intelligence community sending someone over to Walt Disney Studios to talk to uh, Mr. Kimball, who was the creator of Jiminy Cricket, because they wanted to do some kind of work with Disney Studios to kind of bring it out, and, and uh, that's who they approach. Because what it, is, what it is is just testing. It's like testing what would people think, you know? Mm -hmm. How would they react? It doesn't mean they want to do disclosure. It means they just want to test the people. And with that said, what do you think uh, the United States, the people within the United States would do is if the government came out and said, yes, there are UFOs and yes, there are aliens from other worlds, or if, if a saucer were to land, what do you think would be the uh, overall reaction from human beings? Well, look, I'll just tell you what happened here in Denver. Jeff Peckman last year put on the ballot an extra, for an extraterrestrial commission. I mean, this was a ballot where you went, and ro you went to vote for a referendum, you know, for, for different things. And uh, 30, uh, 36,000 out of 72 voted yes. So if 36,000 Denverites voted yes to an extraterrestrial commission, I don't think they're that afraid. I mean, basically, I don't believe personally that the government needs to say that there are UFOs. I think everybody knows. <laughs> I mean, everybody knows that. Why, why does it have to be official? It's like the Pope saying there's UFOs. Like, why, why do we have to wait for some government agency when we all, if we do our homework, we know Stephenville was real. You know Phoenix lights were real. There was the O'Hare case over the O'Hare airport in 2007. There's Hestalin in Europe. There's Rendlesham Forest. My God, there's so much stuff that, I mean, anybody who has a brain knows this is real. <laughs> well, but, you know, the, and, and I agree with you, Paula, but, you know, there still are people out there. Now, I don't know if it's so much that they don't believe it, um, it's they don't want to talk about it or they don't want to appear that they believe in it. You know, there's still that stigma. Uh, I think some people feel like there's still a stigma uh, for people that openly come out and say, I believe in UFOs. Um, you know, they, we still have that, that portion of the population. So, so you don't believe that there would be this major breakdown in society uh, breakdowns in religion and everything else. Well, having lived in Rome and having worked with Monsignor Balducci and spoken with him all over Europe, I know there's no problem with the Catholic religion, at least. And here's Father Funes, that is the main astronomer for the Vatican, saying, you know, there are brothers and sisters, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that there's, there's no problem with religion, that, of course, God created other planets. No, the problem is, everybody says, you know, why do you think the secret is kept secret? Well, I think you understand uh, that the secret is secret because it deals with back-engineered technology. I mean, I, I was with Colonel Corso for two years. I'm the journalist that brought him to Italy. I spent a great deal of time with him. He did have the artifacts from Roswell, and he did work in research and development in the Pentagon. So just say we have these toys, we have these, you know, back-engineered craft. I mean, they're, they're not using gas or oil. They're not using fossil fuels. And there is a group that just doesn't want that out. Yeah.
Yeah, well, I think it's a power thing for sure. I mean, it would disrupt uh, uh, the oil companies and, you know, if we had some type of uh, power that did not require fossil fuel, that's for sure. Now, well, of course we do, yeah. I mean, uh, er, the whole Area 51 thing, the whole, the idea that we have, well, this is a problem, you know, because we don't know what we're looking at anymore. We don't know if it's our stuff or their stuff, so... It, we definitely have a problem with, with the technology. And I think that's going to get worse and worse as our technology grows. And uh, if they are back engineering uh, some of these things that they find in crash saucers, um, it's going to be harder and harder to, uh, you know, see the, uh, the difference between a, a U.S. craft and, and an extraterrestrial craft. Um, you yeah. know, the fact that, that you're from... Uh, uh, from Rome, I wanted to ask you a question, and I'm not sure if this is actually true or not, but I wanted to ask you, didn't the Vatican or some uh, somebody from the Vatican come out two, three years ago and make a statement, a formal statement, that it was okay for Catholics to believe in extraterrestrials and God at the same time? Yeah, well, that's what I just mentioned. Father oh. Funes, who is who is an Argentinian priest, he's out of the Vatican Observatory. He made that statement in the Vatican newspaper, the Osservatore Romano, and he he did say they are our brothers and sisters. And guess what? He's not talking about the little grace. He's talking about human type, human looking aliens that probably created the grace, and he's talking about. Um, you know, other cultures from other planets. And my research shows that there are more diverse humanoid-looking uh, aliens than there are the little extraterrestrial biological entities that we seem to have stamped in our brain because I think we've been kind of brainwashed in this country to think that's the only, only alien there is. So if, if we're... There's other things out there besides these grays. And like you say, you know, if you hear these people who's, who say they've been abducted and they go through regression and all that, they seem to report, uh, you know, they were some type of gray or something that looked close to a generic gray. Um, so where are all these human humanoid-looking ones? We don't seem to hear a lot of reports. I mean, or maybe I don't seem to hear a lot of reports on well, these more human ones. Or are they here with because, us? <laughs> no, no. The problem with no. The problem is that the, it's the reporting. If in my books I cover about five or six different cases, the Charles Hall case in in Indian Springs, 1965, Charles Hall. Weatherman, Indian Springs, four books written about this, the tall whites who were here and had their children with them. The man is telling the truth. He's a military man. Uh, so for people who want to read about that, they can read Millennial Hospitality. Uh, the man is still working uh, on, on a base. Uh, he, he's spoken. I don't know if you ever want to interview him. They're tall whites that happen to have their children. Uh, and the thing is that they were not gray. In Italy, you have, uh, well, first of all, in Switzerland, I went to see Billy Meyer. You have the Pleiadians. You have the, the people from the Pleiades that came. And Switzerland had to shut that story down because Colonel Corso told me that, you know, the more they look like us, the, the more terrifying it becomes because they could be walking among us. Exactly. The other case, yeah, the other case is, uh, the case from Clarion is called Beyond the Heavens, the Maurizio Cavallo case. It's in my books. When he went on the craft, and there's photographs, Polaroids of these people, they look exactly like us. He has the Polaroids in his book. Uh -huh. uh, there's, yeah, yeah, so we're talking about go back to Adamski, go back to, to our early cases that everybody debunks. These human-type aliens came here to warn us to stop using the nuclear, uh, in nuclear energy, nuclear power. It, it was in the 50s, right after the atomic bomb explosions, that we had all of these visitations. And the same kind of alien that came to Adamski, 
who who uh, the he had like a blue jumpsuit on with long blonde hair. That same type came to a contactee in Sicily called Eugenio Sidacusa. And I talked to his people, and basically these these human-type aliens in Italy gave the same message about stopping the use of nuclear. Well, you know, it seems like, uh, you know, the more people you talk about, the more researchers you listen to, this this so this whole thing about uh, the nuclear explosion sure seems to be a pretty pretty good fact that that's probably what got them started. Although there there's been sightings supposedly since the beginning of time, right? Absolutely. Uh, um, so I don't know. Now I I've heard as well though that um, or in addition to that, that, you know, if there's one thing common throughout the universe, it could be DNA. That's the one thing that's common. So it's very possible that if DNA is what, you know, makes us look like we do, what's to say that DNA on, a, on another Earth-like planet wouldn't produce the same thing? Um, they might be a few million years ahead of us, but they would probably look like us, right? So. Absolutely. Well, also, they could have come here a long time ago and, uh, and intermingled with us, and we got some DNA, uh, you know, uh, aberrations, and, and maybe they seeded the planet. I mean, who knows? I, I think there's so many different theories out there, but I think we shouldn't cancel any one of them out. Yeah, well, I don't think we can, that's for sure. What, uh, just out of curiosity, um, and I don't want to get too personal here, so if I am, just let me know. But uh, prior to, to becoming uh, interested in UFOs, were you a religious person? Are you a religious person now? Are you spiritual? Or do you think that has any effect on, on the way people look at this issue well you know i I'm, i was born roman catholic but i'm more spiritual now because i embrace more or less all religions i don't think it's a religious situation i mean why would it be i mean god is uh you know padre balducci used to say to me uh, you think you're going to limit god from creating so many species of butterflies, so many species of animals, so many species of plant, and he just creates one man. He's going to create all kinds of species uh, because God is that, uh, you know, omnipotent. And uh, But uh, Padre Balducci, you know, used to tell me, though, he said man hasn't evolved at all. So if God did create many species, we are on the bottom of the ladder of evolution because we're still killing each other. We still have crime. We still do not love one another like we should, like we were told by Christ to do. And we're still doing each other harm. We're still, you know, after all these years, he used to say, we, we have a lot to learn. He used to also tell me, who'd want to come and meet us? You know, who'd want to meet us? <laughs> Well, you know, back to the religious thing, what I was getting at is that uh, the different people that I interview, it seems if, I, if I'm speaking to somebody that is either a religious person or comes from a religious background, they tend to take a religious view towards the topic. If you have somebody that isn't really religious, they're more scientific, they tend to take a scientific uh, view towards UFOs. Um, it's, it's just funny because, uh, you know, some religious people will tell you, oh, these UFOs, it's all demonic. It's all demonic bad stuff. Um, and I just don't believe that. I just don't believe that. Um, I think if they were demonic, they probably would have done something to us by now, don't you think? 
Well, you know, again, Father Balducci said, you know, the devil doesn't need UFOs. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He really yeah. did believe. He did believe in, and he was a demonologist. Actually, he wrote books on the devil, uh, and he said that has nothing to do with it. And and yeah, it, it, the thing is, it's okay though. I've learned that whatever people want to believe. Uh, it's okay. You can't really convince people who don't want to be convinced if they want to believe it's all scientific and 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 they they can't be interplanetary because they can't get here from far away. Right. Then it's okay. I think it's all okay. I think that you know there's room there. It's a free country. Everybody can believe what they want to believe. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the way we have to go about it. So uh, tell us uh, about some of these books you've written and uh, any one of them your favorite? Well, Connecting the Dots has uh, everybody from David Icke to John Mack to Jesse Marcel Jr. to Heineck to all those people in it. That's the first one, Connecting the Dots, Making Sense of the UFO Phenomenon. And then, uh, you know, another one is All the Above, and it, it is, uh, you know, Exopolitics, All the Above. It is uh, basically uh, uh, dedicated to George Nury because he used to ask me on Coast to Coast, is it interplanetary? Is it paranormal? Is it, you know, interdimensional? And I said, it's all of it. It's all the above. And the last, one of the last books I wrote is called Exopolitics, Stargate to a New Reality, and exopolitics for me is a scholarly academic study of the alien presence and the sociological as well as, you know, the political implications. I mean, we've got to put something in place so we study this. What if we have formal contact? There's nothing in place. So that last book, the, uh, the Stargate to a New Reality, has an amazing case I researched, which is a 1945 uh, a UFO crash in San Antonio, New Mexico. And the two witnesses that were seven and nine are now 72 and 74, and they're still, they're still alive. And they told me how they had witnessed this crash. They were little boys, how they walked up to the craft, how they saw the beings, and they told me they watched the cleanup. And this is about 30 miles from Socorro. The interesting part, Rick, is that when the nine-year-old boy, in the process of watching the cleanup, jumped inside the craft and pulled a piece out, and they still have it. Oh, yes, I've heard about this. Now, what year was this in? Nine, it was August 15, 1945, two months after the atomic, yeah, before Roswell. Roswell was 47, and it was before, uh, it was right after the atomic bomb exploded. These two little kids saw the atomic bomb explode because they were 30 miles from Trinity. Wow. From Trinity wow. site. Now, yeah. they say they still have a piece of this, right? Oh, yeah. Well, the only way I work is I fly up and see the people. Now, the younger one is up in Gig Harbor, Washington. His name is Remy Bach. I flew up there. I saw the piece. I saw the analysis of the piece. I talked to him. The older one is in San Antonio. He has a ranch there, and he is uh, Jose Padilla. And I also went there in October, and I met him, and he showed me the old doll bar and cafe where Oppen Oppenheimer and Einstein used to go and where the guys from the cleanup used to hang out. Wow. Now, tell us about this piece, though. You, you actually got to see it with your own two eyes. Oh, yeah. I got to see it and hold it, and people want more on this story. I took pictures of it, so it's on my website. Okay. It's on the website. It's www.paolahharris, Paola Harris, and I, it's called the San Antonio, uh, New Mexico crash case. And... I took photos of, of everything, so, you know, it's on there if people want to read it. It's also in my book, Exopolitics, Stargate to a New Reality. There's 40 pages of it in there. Now, did, did it was a piece of metallic, right? It was something metallic, this piece? No, the piece, it looks like a handle. Uh, it looks like a handle. He, the uh, the nine-year-old, uh, you know, uh, Jose took a crowbar and 
pried it off the inside. And so in order to analyze it, they had to cut a piece off of it and send it to, they sent it to Los Alamos Labs, they sent it to England. And what it has inside, which is really interesting because it verifies Colonel Corso's work, it has integrated circuits. Oh, my Lord. Inside of the molecular structure like Yes, yes. There's an electron microscope picture on my website. Oh, my God. We'll have to show that to the folks. I'll have to pull that up. Um, unbelievable. Unbelievable stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, when you, when you look at all of the evidence that, like you say, is scattered all over the place, um, I don't see how anybody that is sane could not come back with a conclusion that, you know, at least that there's something going on, you know. Maybe you won't jump all the way to, to saying that they're interplanetary visitors, but my God, there's just too much information. What's your, uh, what have you done, uh, what has your activities been around exopolitics? And for people that may have not heard that word, what is exopolitics exactly? Okay, now, uh, ufology for me was just sightings, okay, and just gathering information. Exopolitics for me, this is my definition and that of Dr. Michael Sala, Exopolitics Institute, it's the academic scholarly study of, of the extraterrestrial presence and the political as well as, uh, as the sociological implications for the planet. In other words, what's happening is you say it's real, right? You know it's real. Now what are you going to do about it? So the situation is, what are we going to do about this? I mean, it's going to affect society. It's going to affect economics. It's going to affect um, uh, politics. So I, I'm working on trying to put together some protocols on what do you do about this thing? What do you do about it? And, of course, my final, um, my final goal would be to have some kind of dis dialogue at the United Nations. All right. Well, what didn't uh, was one of the astronauts that tried to get that uh, going at one time, I believe, with the UN, and they they shut it down or they didn't go for forward with it. But yeah, I think. Well, um, no, it was it was Sir Eric Gary with the country of Grenada because a, a country has to bring forth the uh, the uh, resolution. So Lee Spiegel, who is a writer for the Huffington Post, uh, and and Eric Gary from Grenada brought in, uh, what's his name, Cooper, um, yes. Gordon Cooper, and he brought in Gordon Cooper, Alan Hynek, Jacques Vallée, Stanton Friedman. They all went there, but the problem was that while he was away, there was a coup in the country of Grenada, and Eric Gary couldn't follow it up. I mean, all, they always try to stop it some way. Somehow, yeah, exactly. Wow. Well, listen, uh, you have a, a big event coming up here in not too, uh, too many days, don't you? Well, you're a sweetheart. I'm glad you mentioned that because I didn't <laughs> even, I didn't like, I didn't even go there. But uh, yes, uh, my, my big event is something that I created. It's basically uh, a women, all women symposium on UFOs. And it's got some really powerful, wonderful researchers. But I will add that we do have a panel on Stephenville on um, Saturday afternoon that's moderated by Angela Joyner. And, that's, and you're going to have Steve Allen on, I think it's tomorrow night from that panel. So we do have guys. We have four guys that are speaking on the Stephenville light. So, I mean, it's balanced. I mean, we got guys there. <laughs> but the, the, the speakers are uh, Carol Rosen who worked with Werner von Braun, and she's going to talk about banning weapons in space. Uh, of course, Dr. Lynn Kitai, because you talked about the Phoenix Lights, we're going to have her, we're going to have Lisa Romanak, the, the wife of uh, Stan Romanak, who just wrote an incredible book called From the Other Side of the Bed. Uh, we're going to have Karen Gresham Nickel, who is a hypnotherapist, Tracy Austin Peters, who uh, is a, uh, she's a, a wonderful uh, TV host uh, on a show in Las Vegas called Let's Talk Paranormal. 
and and uh, and we're going to all you know get together and and work on uh, having a dialogue that's a women's mainly dialogue, but it will also include men. Now we also are going to screen the movie The Hen Hand. Uh, the producer is James Carmen. He won the EB Award at the International UFO Festival last year. So it's going to be fun. It's in Texas. It's going to be a Texas experiment. Now and that, a, a real, you know, great thing. And it's in, I believe, Glen Rose, Texas? It's in Glen Rose, Texas. It's May 18th, 19th, and 20th. Okay. Uh, Friday night, it's got a Meet the, uh, the Speakers party. The ladies are all going to wear red cocktail dresses, so it's Lady in Red party. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then we're going to screen the movie. The next day, we're going to have serious conversation serious presentations and sunday is a half a day and we're going to talk about contact ah very good very good now is this is this the first type of of symposium you you've tried to put on or have you done several in the past or well i did 10 of them in europe okay and i did the last one i did i've done 10 symposiums in europe the last one I did was the 60th anniversary of Roswell, where I brought over Jesse Marcel, Jr. I have brought over John Mack, Jesse Marcel, Jr., Richard Dolan, Linda Moulton Howe, uh, just all the top players. I mean, Travis Walton three times. I've paid out of my own pocket to do this. My so Lord. This, yeah, well, I'm very dedicated, and this one, too, is out of my own pocket. So. It's a it's it's an opportunity for people to to come together and just talk, just just gab, just talk about this. That's great. That's great. Well, it sounds like it's going to be a uh, a very good uh, get together. A lot of great uh, speakers there. Um, I've seen the uh, the uh, the poster for this, and uh, I will be bringing it up so that viewers can see it as well. And, and I don't mean this in any disrespectful, disrespectful way, but I, I've never seen a symposium on UFOs with so many attractive women. All of these women are <laughs> attractive women in the UFO thing. What is up with that? I don't know. Well, uh, the thing is that they're very dedicated. I mean, I'm going to be giving Angela Joyner an award. She's going to be getting, like, an Academy Award for, for doing Stephenville. And the thing is that Angela Joyner, you know, lost her job over that. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, she was a mainstream. She was mainstream journalist. She wrote for the Stephenville Tribune, and she got so passionate about UFOs, she lost her job. So... I mean, you know, people have really sacrificed a lot. A lot of people lose their jobs or are ridiculed or whatever, and I think she deserves a, a, a real applause for for just, you know, going after the story. Oh, absolutely. Um, we still have a little time. Can we talk a little bit? Uh, I don't want to get too far into it because, like you say, we have, uh, I'll be interviewing Steve Allen uh, tomorrow night, but... Um, the Stevensville is something that happened back in 2008, I believe. Yeah, it was January. I think it was around January 8, 2008. And it was, and he'll tell you that he, you know, how it happened because he's basically a pilot and a businessman. He flies planes. And he was on the Odom Ranch when he saw this thing up close and personal. But, you know, I said to him, I said, Steve, I mean, did, uh, why are you, why did you put your telephone number in the newspaper? And he said, <laughs> I de he said yeah, he said, I needed validation. He says, look, uh, you know, when you see something like that, you want everybody that saw it to call to sh tell you you're not crazy. You know, so he said that he's been looking for validation. Uh, and he did. He got, you know, the constable, Leroy Gayton, to admit that he saw it, too. You know, so it, it, it was something where he was a real hero also because, he, he, you know, his family said to him, don't talk about it. Don't think you're crazy. Yep. Don't, you know, everybody goes, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. So when you talk to Steve Allen, he is a hero. He is leading this. And he said, <laughs> he said to me, look, he said, I said to President Bush, the gig is up. The cat's out of the bag. We can handle the truth. And I had to laugh. 
you know, he, he just, I, I laugh because he says it in his, his southern, his Texas accent, you yeah. know. Yeah. And, and here's, here's Bush's ranch, like, you know, 30 miles from where this happened. Yeah, and, and uh, again, I don't want to get too far into it, but uh, he's not the only uh, person who saw this. Like you say, the, the constable saw it, and, and there were other people, I think, that came out and, and saw something. Maybe not on that exact day, but I guess they've been having activity off and on ever since that, right? Yeah, they have, you, and there's pictures. I mean, I couldn't believe it. He, he showed me a video that somebody had taken. Right. Uh, you know, so I said to him, I said, Steve, what do you think, why do you think that thing came out of this, you know, right there when you're looking at it? And he told me that when he flew over that area, his compass went to zero, which means that he has, there are places on the Earth that have an electromagnetic anomaly. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, do you think that could be a portal? I mean, if your compass goes to zero in that spot, I mean, obviously it's not northwest, east. You know, it's not, there's no magnetism in that spot. Do you think that that's what, you know, what happened? And there's also a nuclear power plant there, the Cherokee plant. So he'll tell you that, too. Uh, so, yeah, so you've got to ask these questions if you're a good researcher. You really do. Like, why would they bother to go there? Why don't they go to the Bahamas or something if they're on vacation? Well, they sure do seem to like to go around nuclear facilities, uh, Army Air Force bases, uh, that type of thing. They sure do bring in a lot of, uh, of activity, it sure seems like. Yeah, okay, let me, before we close, thank you so much for bringing this subject forward in a very serious light. I thank you and all the media that does this because I think it's time for the young people to understand it's real and to look into it seriously. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the one reason that, uh, that I started doing this show is because I would watch these shows on TV. Of course, you know, there's tons of UFO shows on TV lately. And uh, they would have these great people on the, on the show but then they'd only ask them like one or two questions and then it's edited and they go on to something else. I say, well, wait a minute. <laughs> There's more questions yeah. to be asked here, you know? Uh, yeah. So, you know, it's kind of nice where we can get with some of these people and, and, and ask them more about uh, what's going on and what they saw and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so, Paula, besides... Uh, this uh, 2012 Women's Symposium coming up in May. Uh, what else is anything else that you would like to? Yeah, uh, I will be. Or? Yeah, I will be speaking in Roswell at the Roswell Museum this summer, uh, and I will be speaking there. You know, there's uh, going to be uh, Yvonne Smith and Travis Walton and uh, in. Um, uh, you know, uh, Tom Carey and Don Schmidt and, and Stanton Friedman. So I'll be speaking then, and their, their festival is on the 29th of June this year. It's not on the 4th of July like they usually have it. And I will also, also be speaking in Santa, uh, Sacramento, California, on June 16th for uh, Anthony Sanchez's group. But you know something that the biggest thing that really uh, you know that I love doing is research. So I'm working right now with uh, Travis, uh, trying to get the testimony of the other two lumberjacks that came forth. Uh, you know the Travis Walton story. Well, he's got yes. two lumberjacks, uh, Steve Pierce and John Goulet, who came forth to verify his case, and I saw them at the International UFO Congress, and it was very emotional watching them talk to Travis and apologizing for having left him and all of that. So that's the story I, I'm, I'm covering now. Wow, that would be a great story. Unbelievable. Well, you've just got so much going on. Uh, I, I don't know how you keep your energy level going up all the time like that. Well, it's important, just like it's important for you, it's important for me to make sure we get all of it accurately out there. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, listen, Paula, it's just been an absolute pleasure 
uh, speaking with you, and I, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your evening uh, to talk with us. Um, just very, very nice of you. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, well, listen, uh, I am going to have... Um, I'm going to have your flyer up for your symposium and some graphics uh, regarding your books and stuff on this video. So um, as soon as I get done editing this up, a uh, couple days or so, I will definitely let you know and uh, hopefully we can help promote the, uh, the upcoming symposium with this video. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I, I invite all the people in Texas. This is like a one-shot deal that we want to come and, and listen to the speakers and so forth. And, you know, I, I really encourage people to read the research, read the interviews word for word uh, that are in my five books. And, and, and that's the way you get the real story from the real people. Absolutely. And let's just mention that website again. It's www paulaharris.com and Paula spells her name P-A-O-L-A -A, correct? That's correct. Gotcha. Alright well I'll definitely have that up uh, so people can see it as well so Paula thank you so much again and uh, we'll be staying in touch and we'll be uh, following you to see what you do next. Alright thank you it's uh, been a pleasure. Alright good night Paula. Good night. Bye-bye. You know the Air Force, and and you know that in 1969 the um, the uh, content committee report here at the University of Colorado claimed there was nothing to UFOs, and that just put the kibosh on everything. So he was very angry about that. So he had files that he was investigating. He had you know talked to he he did like the Pascagoula, Mississippi case, you know Hicks and and, and Parker. And, and, and just cases that came up with abductions, I mean, he was fascinated. I never heard him tell me um, what, uh, what he thought they were, but he did say that they were interdimensional as well as interplanetary. Do you think he had any inside information? Um, I know, didn't he get a little um, uh, perturbed uh, with the government? He felt like he was being used or something like that at the end. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Well, do you think he had any inside information? He must have had something, don't you think? No, he had inside information, but they were keeping a lot from him. Uh, and he was angry because he needed to have everything. I and mean, when you're studying this, you need to have everything. And I remember that he was very close to Linda Moulton, how he was doing at that time the cattle mutilation cases. And, and Alan was fascinated with all of it because... You know, being Italian, uh, cattle mutilations, crop circles, uh, abductions, sightings, it's like a cosmic minestrone. I call it minestrone, the Italian word for soup, that has everything in there. Well, you know, uh, you sure don't have much of an Italian accent anymore. No, well, no, but I speak perfect Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I live there. I live search. Uh, I even have my little Kufos card. But... The thing that was important is that he basically taught me how to listen. Mm. Very, very fine art, isn't it? Yeah, because if you uh, are listening to a case or witnesses and you let them talk without making any judgment, you get the whole story. Yes, people tend to uh, to break in when somebody's trying to describe uh, an experience, don't they? A lot of people, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Well, what happens is that they use their own frame of reference, 
and they say, oh, that person's lying or that person isn't telling the truth or, you know, they're exaggerating. But he taught me just to keep quiet because I learned after 40 years from now uh, that uh, basically, you know, the truth is stranger than fiction. A lot of this is true. Oh, I, I think so, too. I am a believer. Uh, uh, just so you know, I, I am a newbie to the uh, whole UFO uh, agenda, and uh, I, I got started when I watched uh, the documentary, uh, The Phoenix Lights. So kind of the same thing as you as far as a start. Um, what was it like working with J. Allen Hynek? That, that just must have been fantabulous. Yeah, it was. He was a great guy. He, if you saw Close Encounters, he, he's that very distinguished gentleman with the white hair and the pipe. He always had that pipe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he, he basically um, was trying to get to the truth. And you know that he had worked in Blue Book, so, uh, you know, that he had worked for the government. This is not, as you know, this is not a normal um, kind of career or a normal kind of undertaking. Basically, ni 1979, I saw the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I was an English teacher. I was very moved by the um, scene at the end where Francois Truffaut had a contact with the aliens. I was teaching science fiction in school at the time because I was teaching high school. And I came to find out that Dr. J. Allen Hynek was the uh, consultant on that film with uh, Steven Spielberg. And so I did my research and found out he had a center for UFO studies in Evanston, Illinois, that he had been part of Project Blue Book. So just by accident, you know, I live in Colorado. I went to uh, Chicago for a wedding and decided to drop in because I was there anyway into his offices at Kufos. I got to meet him. He asked me to work with him for six years doing Italian translations. So I worked with the best. You know, Kynick was the best. At that time, he had the Center for UFO Studies, and Steven Spielberg was even on his board of directors. So, you know, I, I got to see all kinds of cases. I got to travel with Alan. Um, he taught me how to do field degrees there for um, 15 years and, and could do my work there much, much better than here. And I came back in 2007. I was teaching in Rome at the American Overseas School of Rome. That was my day job. And because I had worked with Heineck, they put me on TV. I wrote articles. I still do. I write for a magazine in Rome called X Times. And I just did the Clifford Stone case for them. And I also did the uh, interview with Kenneth Arnold's daughter for them. So, you know, the good part about my work is that it goes viral. It goes to Italy, and I, I spoke in France, so it goes to France. It goes to these places. Well, now, you've been doing this for 40 years, so uh, yeah. after 40 years, what's, what's your thought on UFOs? Uh, what do you think they are? Do you think there's... I have no idea. <laughs> after 40 years, well, you know, Somebody asked me on a show last week uh, about MUFON. They said, you know, MUFON's been uh, in business now or, or together for 50 years, and uh, we're no further along than we were 50 years ago. Um, so it takes a lot for somebody um, to keep digging in and interviewing and investigating uh, for 40 years like you have. Uh, what do you think has, has caused you to... Uh, you know, keep that fight going? Well, you know, first of all, uh, i got to say a couple of things. Uh, thank God for MUFON because they do the sighting part, okay? So we got all this archive of sighting. 
Uh, thank God for other researchers who work with abductions or, or uh, contact. I prefer to call it contact. I was really close to Dr. John Mack. He came to Rome, to Italy, and spent some time with me. Plus, I was, I was his translator in Florence when he gave his last speech, uh, one of his last speeches. So, you know, thank God for those guys out there. Thank God for the crop circle researchers. I don't do that kind of work. You know, thank God for my colleague, Linda Howe, who did the, the cattle mutilations. I mean, all these guys put their heart and soul into it. The problem is, and I'll be honest with you, we don't all get together. If we would all get together, um, we would be able maybe to get to it. But the uh, UFO um, uh, research group is so splintered that we just we don't get together and discuss all this. So what would I like to do? What's my dream? To have, have this be part of a university class, to have a whole entire section of a university and call it exopolitics, which is where I've gone, uh, and or sociology or exosociology or something in the, socio, in the social sciences department. You know, I've written five books of, of all, they're all interviews, every one of them. I mean, I've got 30 interviews. Oh, you're breaking up there, Paula. I've got uh, 38 interviews in my last book. Do you hear me now? I hear you now. Yeah. Uh, so if we could have in the university, if we could have, uh, a, 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 you know, some kind of department, we would we be good at this. Well, uh, now you are a a teacher by trade is that correct yeah i have a master's in education in, in education uh are there any classes in universities 